Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, during the first 20 years of my professional career, I traveled very extensively. As a scientist, a naturalist, a nature photographer, I visited every single country on the planet. I even circumnavigated both polar regions and been through pretty much every major national park. But wherever I went, I saw the mass destruction and the fast disappearance of our natural habitat, which deeply bothered me. So I was constantly looking for an answer. What is most responsible for this? And where do we have to focus our limited resources if we wanted to turn this around and if we wanted our sustainable planet back? And today, my short answer to this big question is our food. It is our ever-growing appetite that slowly clear nearly all natural habitat off the surface of this planet and turn it into a man-made landscape. Today, our planet's surface is a vast network of human habitat, and the last remaining natural places are just tiny, unsustainable patches in it. Of the giant surface of our planet, ladies and gentlemen, only a small part is only habitable by humans to begin with. And of these by now, only 6% can be considered a truly untouched natural ecosystem. All the rest has been cleared out or altered for human use. And what is surprising is that only 1% of all this damage was done for direct human habitat. All our cities, villages, roads and railways, mines and other infrastructure, they make up just about 1 million square kilometers. All the rest, some 100 million square kilometers, are used for agriculture purposes only. So it is our ever-growing appetite for food, for timber, for medicine, even for flowers, for Christmas trees, for Halloween pumpkins, even our clothing, biodiesel, and many other agriculture, pro agriculture products that cleared up over 100 million square kilometers off the surface of our planet. And the, con and the consequences of this are catastrophic. First of all, it disrupted our entire carbon cycle. It also created a massive loss of biodiversity. It also disrupted our water cycles, and it also disrupted our weather patterns. But worst of all, it exposed our planet's most valuable and most irreplaceable resource, the topsoil. Of all the resources we have on Earth, soil, is the least appreciated and most underrated. Among other values, it stores an incredible amount of carbon, more than twice as all land biomass in the entire atmosphere combined. And a lot of this carbon was released into the atmosphere over the past few centuries by constantly turning our soil upside down, exposing it to sunlight and letting it erode. And today, in order to reduce this increased number of, and amount of carbon, we are coming up with hundreds of ideas lately. Giant machines that make snow in the Arctic, small particles we will shoot into the upper atmosphere, or giant sails we will make in space. Now, these will perhaps temporarily solve some of our problems, but I strongly believe that for the long-term elimination of our complex environmental problems, we have to restore natural habitat. We must diminish the surface area we occupy, and we must return to a stage where human settlements are modern, flourishing, but isolated patches in the vast network of healthy ecosystems. This is not only the best and most comprehensive solution to our global environmental problems, but also by far the cheapest. Natural habitat, for the most part, will restore themselves. Shall we give them a chance? So let's imagine, let's fantasize for a second that we were able to give up some 40 million square kilometers of natural habitat, for, for, uh, land for the regrowth of natural habitat. For the first 10 years, they will build around 30 gigatons of carbon into their bodies and root systems. After 50 years, this number would grow to about 180 gigatons. And over just 100 years, the number would peak at 270 gigatons. And considering that we're increasing 
the atmospheric carbon by about four gigatons annually. This project alone, for the next 50 years, could keep atmospheric carbon at current levels, even if we did nothing to reduce our emissions in the meanwhile. And this number does not even calculate with the enormous amount of carbon that will be sequestered by the renewed soil. So ladies and gentlemen, it is time to take a serious and closer look at how we can free up some agricultural land in order to regrow some natural habitat, while at the same time grow healthy and nutritious for food for ourselves. So where can we grow this food if not on these cultivated lands? Well, the answer is neither new nor any surprising. Once we do not, have, do not have any more space to expand horizontally, we shall expand vertically. We have done the very same for our own living in our own cities, so why would we not do the same for our food? I believe that we must create buildings to grow our food indoors, and the outdoors must be spared for what they're meant, natural habitat. Now, as I said, vertical farms are pretty much nothing new these days. Growing healthy food in a soilless environment under LED lights in a fully automated building is no longer a thing of the future. And their advantages are really, really obvious. Because they're com completely sealed off from the outside world. Wind, light, radiation, temperature, humidity can all be controlled inside. And with them, damages from frost, from hail, from drought, and from many other environmental problems can be eliminated entirely. Because it is sealed off and its air is constantly sterilized, no chemicals shall be used at all. Everything is easier to robotize and automate here, so we can easily overcome the severe shortage of labor that is typical of this sector today. But most importantly, this building will use a tiny fraction of water and fertilizers that it would use outdoors. And because we can make them extremely tall, we can build or grow an enormous amount of food on a tiny piece of land surface. And because we can place them wherever we want, we can eliminate a lot of food waste by building them right where the consumers are, so we don't have to store or transport food for long distances. And because, we can, and because they can work all year round, our co consumers get fresh, nutritious supply every single day of the year. But there's one major problem with all current vertical farm projects. They're all focusing on lettuce, microgreens, herbs, perhaps strawberries, which I understand this is, these are the ones that are profitable for them. But they represent a tiny fraction of our total land use. Even if you put all the world's lettuce and strawberries into vertical farms, we are still only making place for just about 10,000 square kilometers of natural habitat. And to help put vertical farming into the right direction, I decided to spend the next 20 years of my career in the agriculture sector. And I created the Ultimate City Project. This is a vertical farm project that focuses on this brand new industry, not for its opportunities to make profit, but for its incredible capabilities to restore natural habitat without compromising human food sources or without disrupting local communities. As a very first step in this project, we carried out a very detailed analysis of how we can free up the most amount of land with the least amount of investment. And perhaps not surprisingly for many of you, animal farming came out as the absolute winner. And here comes this number again. There are currently, we are currently using 40 million square kilometers of land surface to grow food for our animals or to allow them to graze. This is by far the largest waste of resources of our society because they occupy 80% of all cultivated land, yet they only provide 20% of total human calories. And they're also very harmful to the environment in many other ways. They produce a lot of toxic gases and other toxic waste. For all these reasons, scientists keep warning us for decades that if we wanted a sustainable planet, we must stop eating red meat completely. By doing so, we would make space for an enormous amount of natural habitat. Yet we would only lose 20% of our total calories, which we can easily make up for by focusing and eliminating some of 
our food waste problems. But just like in many other cases, we do not seem to be interested in any easy solutions to our environmental problems. Despite all these warnings about red meat, we keep consuming more and more daily, and our society heavily protests the idea of lab-grown or 3D-printed meat. So because there is no change in sight, I decided to focus on another possible solution, one that could be beneficial for the farmers, for the environment, for the animals, and our consumers at the same time. From this, the ultimate city feed tower was born. It is a building where all animals, all livestock are housed indoors, but most importantly, all of their food is also produced indoors. It has 50,000 square meters of production area at each level, and it can have as many levels as is required by the number of livestock. As an example, let's see a dairy farm with 1,000 cattle. That dairy farm would need about 18,000 tons of wet feed annually, which is currently grown on 3,600 hectares of alfalfa land. In our indoor hydroponic system, after several years of careful testing, we can now seed and sprout a variety of green plant species, a mix that is designed to match or outperform the current dry matter content of a typical cattle feed. Under LED lights, ideal temperature and ideal nutrients for these plants, the mix can now be harvested at each 20 days. And with an increased uh, density of seeding, we can achieve 60 tons of wet feed per level at each 20 days, which comes to about 1,000 tons of wet feed at each level annually. And because for these animals, we need 18,000 tons. That farm alone will only need 18 levels in order to feed all of their animals with indoor farm food all year round. Now, let's see again the advantages of this. For our animals, it provides fresh, nutritious, chemical-free, and disease-free food for every single day of the year, which largely improves their digestion, their overall health, and reduces a lot of their stress factors. And our building also provides them with a lot more space compared to traditional facilities. And for the environment, a single building like this would replace 3,600 hectares of cropland, which can now be used to restore natural habitat. And at current technological levels, this building will only need nine hectares worth of windmills and solar panels to grow all of its green energy. It uses 93% less water and 100% less chemicals compared to outside growing. And on the restored areas, millions upon millions of trees will grow very fast, making cross-laminated timber-based construction very sustainable and very inexpensive, basically creating a brand new era of construction, timber-based construction, while largely eliminating almost all unsustainable steel and concrete from this building. As explained before, these buildings will also avoid a lot of food waste. And by building them, we don't have to build and use a lot of tractors and other combustible engine machinery for our agriculture. With some new inventions, these buildings will also capture all toxic waste and greenhouse gases that our animals produce. So all in all, with these buildings, in the next coming decades, we will offset enormous amount of atmospheric carbon. For our consumers, again, we will provide fresh, nutritious, sustainable meat every day of the year with a tiny ecological footprint. And for our farmer, it will make life very easy. His previously hard work will now be largely automated. His earnings will go up, and even his children will be more likely to stay in the family business. And on his freed up land, he will now participate in habitat restoration programs with us, which will provide him with new additional ways of income and a huge array of new opportunities. And in order to free up 40 million square kilometers of natural habitat. Ladies and gentlemen, all we need is a million of these buildings to house all of our cattle and another 400,000 to house all of our pigs and sheep. And these numbers are not as outrageous as they first seem. There are currently one and a half billion buildings around the world and at least 22 million apartment buildings 
which are at least 10 stories tall. So all we need is to increase the number of tall buildings globally by 5 to 10 percent, and we have replaced 40 million square kilometers of natural habitat. To summarize, ladies and gentlemen, I strongly believe that for the long term uh, solutions to some or most of our environmental problems, we have to create vertical farms to grow our food and to allow our natural habitat to regrow. These buildings will allow our natural habitat to recapture the majority of carbon we have ever released into the atmosphere. Natural habitat is a natural carbon sink, a carbon capturing machine perfected by evolution, and they will clean up the mess we have created. And in exchange, in turn, at the same time, we will create a seemingly endless new growth opportunity for our construction industry, which in turn will provide better, safer, healthier, and more sustainable food for us, and a much better life for our animals. So ladies and gentlemen, what is a win-win situation if that wasn't? Thank you.